Willie. Great to have you with me this evening. What a week that was, what a week that lies ahead as uh, Democrats demonstrate once again they have no clue about how to conduct uh, foreign affairs, much less domestic ones. So uh, we'll see what happens in the week that's coming up, but I anticipate there'll be more incompetence, the misspelling of words in Russia with special gifts to the Russian foreign minister, and the fact that Obama's planning trips now to Britain, to France, and to Czechoslovakia, and all places east of here when Timothy Geithner, tax turbo Tim, is incapable of filling key positions, and the American economy continues to waffle largely downward. Two other factoids that uh, will not hit the mainstream media. Number one, number one is this one, that since records have been kept for 100 years, no president in the first 50 days of his administration, has a worse economic record than Barack Hussein Obama. The Dow has dropped approximately $2 trillion in value since January the 20th, and uh, the wealth of the American people is evaporating before our very eyes. As he attacks achievement, attacks high earners, and attacks those who have been successful to give more monies to those who didn't earn it properly in the first place. That's number one. Number two, as far as the popularity of Barack Hussein Obama, it's kind of a garden variety, around 60%, which is about where the popularities have been in the last five or six presidents after 50 days. But the little unreported fact is that among all the last 60 years of presidents, Obama is second from the bottom in those who disapprove of the job he's doing. So slowly but surely, step by step, the American people are figuring out that they elected a socialist. And that is no more true than in his proposal to heap more of the tax burden upon high-income Americans. For example, the top 1% of Americans pay 30% of the bills. The top 3% of Americans pay 50% of all the bills. So that means about 4 million Americans pay 50% of the bills for 305 million Americans, which is an incredible number. What Obama's doing is saying, line up 100 citizens. I'm going to make everybody equal. I want the five citizens on the far right to take money out of your pocket and give it to the 95 citizens who didn't earn your money. Essentially, it's income redistribution discrimination. It's also counterproductive. When you tell achieving successful Americans that that is a very high price tag, you're likely to discourage the type of behavior that causes high income. And if you tell low-income Americans, those making below, say, $40,000 a year, who don't pay any federal income taxes, that because of your status you get a benefit, you're likely to discourage one form of behavior which is most desirable and encourage that form of behavior which is least desirable. How do you encourage charitable donations by taxing them? How do you encourage purchasing stocks when the values are going down and the, and the capital gains rate is going to go up if there are any profits? How do you encourage entrepreneurs who take more risks, who already pay a disproportionate high part of the tax burden, by taxing them beyond their capability to pay and to grow, grow the market and grow jobs? How does any of that work? Only in the mind of a socialist does it work. In fact, the Drudge Report tonight has a posting of a New York Times reporter who asked him if he was a socialist. Obama calls back in the New York Times reporter and says, or thought he, he was joking about the socialist question. Obama is so much out of touch with reality. He doesn't understand that redistributing the wealth, much as he told Joe the plumber in Toledo, Ohio, he wanted to do, is somehow socialistic. He doesn't get the point. And I find it amazing. Now, once again this week, the White House went after Rush Limbaugh, Rick Santelli, and uh, Jim Cramer. They're playing a crass political game by sending out attack dogs, Begala and Carville, in order to smear the Republican Party with the use of the term Rush Limbaugh, because Rush is very popular with people like you and I. So they want to define the opposition as represented by an individual. They know what they're doing. They want to get your eye off the prize. They want you to forget about Obama and start thinking about Rush Limbaugh. It's classic political avoidance. Whenever Paul Begala or James Carville show up on television, you know bile and puke are going to come out of their mouths because they're political attack dogs. And how is this, how is this hope over fear? How is this changing the political climate? I care about my country. I want my country to be successful. I don't want Obama to succeed. What righteous American wants a socialist agenda for this country? I want Obama's socialist agenda to fail, as I'm sure it will. Can anyone point to one country on the face of the earth where over the long term communism or socialism has succeeded? Give me the place. Give me the name of the place. But that is the system that Nancy Botox Pelosi and the feckless one, Harry Reid, along with Ted Kennedy and John Kerry and Barney Frank and Barack Hussein Obama, want to impose against your wishes on you. So don't let them play this typical, political, inside-the-beltway Washington gang of defining the opposition. You and I are smart enough not to be distracted by such baloney. The, the stock market has gone down 20% since, uh, since January 20th. The definition of a re recession is the stock market down by more than 20%. So we're in the middle of a recession caused by Obama, in the middle of a recession, caused by Democrats, Republicans, policy starting in 1977 with the Community Reinvestment Act. And what's amazing is the lack of media reporting. You might recall that when it was assumed in October or November that Obama was going to win, there would be, after January 20th, such a glow 
in such a sense among the American people that good things were happening, that great things were happening, and that everything right and just and good was going to happen after the glow, that there was going to be a honeymoon period of several weeks or months after those damn babbling incompetents named Hank Paulson and George Bush left the stage. That when Obama came, the thought was the market was going to go up. Many people thought that with the new president, with a young family, with an attractive family, and a new direction, the stock market would go up starting in January, February, March, and April. Correct? That was the conventional wisdom. But when it came out that he was attacking capital, attacking dividends, declaring war on successful Americans who want to make charitable donations, who may want to build a second or third home that puts to work thousands and thousands of middle-class Americans, who goes after the travel industry, as Obama's done, telling Americans not to travel, don't go to Las Vegas, don't go to uh, Flagstaff, Arizona, don't go to Miami, Florida, stay away. Then he went after the 1.2 million Americans who uh, work in the private plane industry. He told American business and others that you really shouldn't buy private aircraft, and that's putting out of work hundreds of thousands of middle-class Americans who make those private uh, airplanes. So when it was discovered that the rhetoric he heard in the church of Jeremiah Wright would become policy in the United States of America. That was it. People said, I've had it with that, and they're dumping their stocks, and high-income Americans and others are pulling back because Obama does say this is the beginning of the end. Obama does say this is a crisis. It is a crisis because unless he changes his ways and starts talking effusively and positively about the American economy, guess what? This stock market ain't even seen close to the bottom. I know Judicial Watch and my good friend Larry Clayman is going to file a citizen a uh, lawsuit to try to find out the millions of dollars in expensive parties that Obama's have thrown in the White House over the past seven weeks. That is historically unprecedented during tough economic times. And can you see the Obamas and others in a conga line snaking in and out of various parts of the White House as blood, sweat, and tears are playing their greatest hits, all while Americans are suffering to the extent that we are? Can you see that happening in the non-media coverage of a Republican? You might recall that Nancy Reagan would borrow expensive dresses from designers, and the media went after her hook and claw because of the economic difficulties caused by the Jimmy Carter administration to Ronald Reagan in 1981 and 1982. The media went after Reagan, Nancy Reagan, with alacrity. But now that it's Obama, they cannot really take down that mission-accomplished banner in the nation's newsrooms that were hung up on November the 5th. It's an incredible tale. Also, I found out in an email, maybe God Almighty was trying to communicate to you and I, because on November the 5th, if you go to the Illinois State Lottery website, the pick three on November the 5th of last year, the election, remember that, November the 5th of last year? You know what the three numbers were picked by the Illinois Lottery? Kevin Haas, guess the three numbers picked by the Illinois Lottery, pick three on November the 5th of 2008. Bingo. 666, six, six. a mark of the beast. And I'm thinking, is God, is God Almighty trying to send us a message? by punishing us for the choices that we made, ignorant as they were. And Hannity picked up on this, uh, as Sean always picks up on almost everything, a couple nights ago. And that is that the fear I have, and that you have, and that he has, about the lack of information contained within the heads of many of the Americans who voted this guy into power last November. The lack of information. You might recall the Zogby poll conducted a couple weeks that John JohnZiegler.com did, how Obama got elected, where something like 60% of Obama voters did not know in 2008 which political party controls the House of Representatives in the U.S. Senate. The majority thought the Republicans were in charge when they have not been since 2006. If you talk to Obama voters, most do not know who the Vice President of the United States is. Most of the Obama voters cannot name one U.S. Senator from their home state. Most Obama voters cannot name who their congressman is. So if voters are that stupid during the information age, don't we get what we deserve? Now, as a aficionado of talk radio, much like myself, you are much more likely to be informed about the great issues of the day than those who are listening to FM or not listening to radio, reading the newspapers on the, on the Internet, reading the Drudge Report every day, reading WorldNetDaily.com, Joseph Farah, as I do every day, understanding what's happening on Newsmax.com, go to RealClearPolitics.com or Politico.com, websites that I read three, four, five times a day. And most people in talk radio own homes, drive their own cars, have cell phones, have credit cards, American Express, etc., because we're the achievers and we're the successful ones in the country. Sadly, 64 million Americans, ignorant about the most basic elements of our political system, listen to this guy promising a free lunch, identifying five evil Americans who are successful and blaming them for the problems in the country when that 5% already pay about 65% of the taxes. That's not fair. Yes, it's not fair to them. 
That's the problem. Today does mark the beginning of the end. 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 Well, it makes me want to live my life well, doesn't it? It's the beginning of the end. That was a cut from like eight days ago. This is the beginning of the end.